Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Robert Cummings in Bellamy Partridge's FOB America on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. Jane Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present F.O.B. America, based on a story by Bellamy Partridge. I suppose this title will remind most people of the familiar phrase F.O.B. Detroit. And the story is indeed about the beginnings of the automobile age, the days when the horse and buggy were just beginning to give place to the new rubber-tired contraption, which, more perhaps than any other single invention of our time, changed the face of America, changed our customs, our habits, and our ways of happiness. Not all believed in the automobile at first, and those who did were pioneers of a special kind. Our story is about them, and I think you will find it a charming and gay piece of Americanism. To star in it, we are fortunate to have that fine young actor, Robert Cummings. And now a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss, before we begin the first act of F.O.B. America. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the right words. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it, and in the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. And now Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Bellamy Partridge's F.O.B. America, starring Robert Cummings. <laughs> In New York City, a daredevil motorist had been arrested for speeding up Broadway at the rate of eight miles an hour. And P.T. Barnum was exhibiting a horseless carriage in his Congress of Freaks. The 20th century was young, and so was Tom Hunter, yet not too young to have ambitions beyond his father's farm and following a horse and plow from dawn to dusk. One day, Tom walked into the nearby small town with a bundle of clothes under one arm. The only friend he knew in town was Gid Wilson. Your father were always was a hard man, Tom. Just threw you off the farm without reason, eh? Oh, he had his reasons. I never was much good with the chores. Uh-huh. Your pa was always complaining about you when he come in here. Said you spent too much time tinkering with machinery. Well, he invented some kind of mechanical cow milker, didn't you? <laughs> yes, and a double cultivator so heavy our plow horse couldn't even pull it. <laughs> well, uh, coming back to a job for you, Tom... I wish I could help you, but a general store around these parts can't use more than one man. Well, it's all right, kid. Uh, thanks, anyway. Oh, just a minute. You got any money? Well, I got ten cents. I, I found it in the road when I was walking into town. Hmm. <laughs> can't eat or buy lodgings on ten cents. Yes, well, I never earned any cash money. I guess not. Say, I tell you what, you can sleep nights here in the store. Oh, that's nice of you, kid, but it's I... settled, you hear? And... You take this to tide you over. Five dollars? Oh, no, I, I couldn't do that. You yet. can you... pay me back when you get a job. At least this will buy your meals at Mrs. Bannister's boarding house. No, no, Gid, you must Now, you do listen that. to me, Tom. There's nothing worse for a man's pride than reaching in his pocket and just feeling the lining. What's that? Only one thing it could be. Mike Meeker and that crazy horseless buggy. Come on, this will be fun. Ike's the only one in town fool enough to buy one of those new toys. All I can see the good for is scaring away crows. Hey, Ike, what you doing? What's it look like? I'm cranking her up. Well, don't wind her so tight, Ike. You'll bust the main spring. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think this is, Andy? The goblin four-wheel clock? Uh, here, Gid, hold my coat. I'm going to crawl underneath and look at the engine. Huh? Well, what do you know about these devil wagons? Well, only what I've read in books. Hey, Gid. Who's the boy? Old Everett Hunter's son. 
You've seen him in the store, Andy. Mm, hadn't noticed. Mighty bright boy. Too bright, maybe. His pa run him off the farm for it. Is that so? Suppose he's looking for a job? Tom? Why, I... Oh, he's got a good job. Working for me. I see. All right, Mr. Meeker. Try cranking her again. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, boy. Thanks a lot. So long, Tom. Say, young fellow. Uh, yes, sir? How'd you fix that contraption? Oh, it was just the wiring in the magneto. I, I've studied up on engines. You have, huh? Well, oh, boy, I'm Andy Brackett. I own the liver station. Now, wait a minute, Andy. You keep out of this, kid. I got a big horse auction coming up tomorrow. I could use a bright young clerk. Andy, I said he's got a job. Come on, Tom. Uh, but, kid... Uh, wait, wait. I'll pay him $3 a day. Goodbye, Andy. Uh, kid, please. All right, $5. You know how to keep books, don't you, boy? Well, sure he does. Why do you think I hired him? You haven't, kid. He's working for me as of now. Aren't you, boy? Well, I... I uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Twenty, thirty, forty. How much did I take in today, Tom? Uh, over twenty-five hundred dollars, Mister Brackett. I'm counting the bills now. A real good auction. Folks around here appreciate fine horsemen. Yes, sir. By the way, I like the way you handled yourself today. Got every bid when it was called. Checked figures right and everything. <laughs> Your job is permanent, son. Oh, uh, but I. Well, I... of course now. I, I I can't pay you five dollars each and every day. We'll we'll make it fifty a month, huh? Uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll work for one month, sir. What's that? Well, uh, I don't want office work. I, I want to do things with my hands, you see. You mean a day laborer? Boy, nobody ever got anywhere working with his hands. Well, that isn't what I mean, sir. Uh, I, I don't want to be behind a desk or dressed up in city clothes all the time. Well, then what's it going to be? Well, that's trouble, sir. I... I just don't know. Oh, Dad. In here, Lucy. Dad, one of the men told me you sold every horse. Dad made the best profit yet. Oh, wonderful. Now, you can't put me off any longer. Now, Lucy, we went all over that last night. I'm not going to lay out good hard money for some gadget that's just a fad. But it's not a fad. People everywhere are buying them. She's right, Mr. Brackett. I read that in New York City, they've got over a hundred of them right now. A hundred? Why, there must be thousands. Of automobiles? Oh. Good heavens, no. I'm talking about bicycles. Lucy, Lucy, this is Tom Hunter. Oh, how do you do? Hello. Now, if you want to work your powers of persuasion, Lucy, try Tom here. He thinks he doesn't want to work for me. Dad, you're trying to get me off the subject, which is bicycles. Last year, you wanted a riding horse, so I gave you bluegrass, the finest mare in the county. And now I want a bicycle. <laughs> All right. You'll get a bicycle. <laughs> You see, Mr. Hunter, never stop till you get what you go after. I guess that's right. Mr. Brackett, I, I know what kind of business I want to go into. Oh? When did you decide that? Just now. Uh, I'm going to open a, a bicycle repair shop. I've got my shop, kid. I rented Slocum's barn. Now all I need is tools. You can have them on credit, Tom. Remember, you've got to keep enough cash to eat and sleep on. Oh, I'll eat somehow, and I'll, I'll sleep in the back of the shop. Uh, Tom, I, I know you're a bicycle man, but do you suppose you could fix my gasoline buggy? Well, I'll, I'll sure try, Mr. Meeker. Young man, room and board are five dollars a week. Think you can pay me that out of a little bicycle shop? Uh, no, Mrs. Bannister, but I can out of my garage business. Why, well, this town's got three automobiles now. Tom, I'm tired of my bicycle. You know anyone who might buy it? Uh, maybe. Uh, why don't you get your father to buy you a, a car, Lucy? What? What are those ridiculous things? With my dad renting and selling horses? Well, he, he'd better get out of that business. The day of the horse is almost over. Oh, never, Tom, never. Oh, just think of it. Ten miles an hour. On a paved road, Mrs. Bannister, she can do 20. Oh, good heavens. 
And you drove this all the way over from Albany? Yes, ma'am, in seven hours. I only had seven punctures, too. And if I sell the car to somebody in town here, the agency in Albany has agreed to pay me a commission. Oh, then this isn't your own. Oh, no, no. Where could I ever get $650? You'd be wasting your money anyway. They'll never be as dependable as the horse. And the way they turn up dust. The paved roads would change that part of it. Well, they're only good in fair weather anyway. Why, almost every time there's a shower, Mr. Meeker has to hire a horse to pull that machine of his out of some bog. Well, paved roads are the answer again. Look, Mrs. Bannister, I'll move over and you drive for a while. What? Me? Yeah, I want to show everybody in town it's safe for a woman as well as a man. Now, you just take hold of the tiller here and, and move it from the oh, right. No, 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 Tom, I die of fright. No, no, please, Mrs. Bannister. Just... You guys, that horse! Oh, cut the switch. What? I've got it. Tom! Tom, it threw its rider. Good Lord. It's Lucy Brackett. Lucy, are you hurt? Quiet, quiet, Blue Breath. It's all right. Oh, I, I, I'm terribly sorry, Lucy. I, I didn't see you. Oh, I'm sure you didn't, Mr. Hunter. You were too taken up with that evil-smelling invention that you think is better than a horse. Uh, Lucy, if there's anything I can do... You can hold my stirrup for me. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, Lucy, please, you, you mustn't hold this against me. Why, why should I? You didn't succeed in killing me, and you won't succeed in running my father out of business either. Lucy. He'll still have his livery table long after you and your, your stupid automobiles have been left out of town. Good day, Mr. Hunter. Tom, did you ever see such a sight in your life? Wearing them right out on Main Street. Hmm? Wearing what? She's wearing breeches like a man. Oh, she was? She, and they're blue. And they blaze up like lightning in the night. Her britches? Oh, no, ma'am, her eyes. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of FOB America, starring Robert Cummings. When collectors of English silver want to judge the worth of any article, they first look on the back. They are looking for the hallmark. This tells them the maker's name, the year it was made, and, above all, the quality of the silver used. Ever since the days of King Edward III, back in 1327, the hallmarks of English silversmiths have been the means of identifying and judging the worth of silver. We all know there's another hallmark today, and it, too, is used as a means of identifying and judging excellence and craftsmanship. It's the crown and hallmark on the back of a hallmark greeting card. When you see that familiar hallmark, it's like a stamp of approval on your own good taste and judgment. For you know that inside the card are words that bring happiness. They're the right words for the occasion and for the person you have in mind. In fact, the hallmark card you select says what you want to say, the way you want to say it. At fine stores across the country, you'll find Hallmark cards for every occasion, for birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, or any day you want to remember your friends. And don't forget that Hallmark on the back is recognized everywhere as a sign of quality and excellence. It tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of FOB America, starring Robert Cummings. <laughs> Forty or fifty years ago, the life of the American small town still largely revolved about old Dobbin. Main Street was a dirt road lined with horse troughs and hitching rails and livery stables and blacksmith shops. Then came the automobile, and Main Street was all but smothered in billowing clouds of dust. Tom Hunter was one of the first to fight for paved roads, but he was losing his battle. Tom! Oh, hello. Come on back, Gid. What are you making now? Oh, new kind of tire rim. Ought to be an easier way to change tires, you know. Uh-huh. Going to patent it? Maybe. I've got a lot of ideas. 
Headlamps lighted by electricity, better type of clutch, lots of things. I guess you've got plenty of time for inventing with the bridge closed for repairs. Yes, too much time. <laughs> I took this barn out here on the edge of town because the rent was cheap. Never thought the bridge might block me off from my customers. Mm-hmm. You know who closed the bridge? The road commission. And Andy Brackett. Yeah, maybe. Sure, he's on the road commission. When you started talking up the idea of paving Main Street and bringing new state highway through town, Andy decided it was time to run you out of business. Get automobiles have just got to have paved roads. We're choking in dust. Well, that's fine with Andy. Fewer automobiles around, the better he'll do at the livery stable. No pavement, no highway, no motorists. And no Tom Hunter. Mm -hmm. Oh, say, speaking of Andy, I hear his daughter is seeing quite a bit of Asa Parker these days. Yeah, I, I guess that's her affair. Even going to dances together. Heard about it? Yes. Understand Andy's all for the match. Asa being in the bank, he could have a lot to say about paving Main Street. Uh, let's, let's talk about something else, kid. Well... Oh, Tom! You busy? Why, no, Mr. Meeker. Oh, that blame machine of mine's busted down again. Blew a tire all to Flinders, up by Grayson's drugstore. Oh, that's too bad. Let me see, I, I think I've got a new one in your size. I'll take two of them. One of the back tires is wore down to nothing. All right, I'll get them. Uh, how much is this going to cost me? Uh, what, well, $70 for each tire. Seventy? Seventy. Well, yes, that's the standard price, Mr. Meeker. I can't afford money like that. I ain't put 2,000 miles on my tires. Well, it's our bad roads. They just eat up the rubber. Yes, know. and eat me out of the house at home. The whole blame contraption ain't as good as a horse with the sparrows. I'm ready to give the plaguey thing away. The first fool will take it. You, you mean that, Mr. Meeker? Hey, you want it? It's yours. For half of what it cost me. Four hundred dollars. It's a deal. Oh, wait a minute, Tom. You haven't got that kind of money. No, but I, I think I know where I can get it. I, I'm going to walk up to the bank and talk to Asa Parker. In other words, you can pay down $100, and you want our bank to lend $300 more and hold the automobile as security? Uh, yes, that's the idea, Asa. <sighs> Mr. Hunter, the banking interests of America have investigated this motor car industry, and we have concluded that these new playthings are no proper security for loans. Well, why not? You lend money on horses, and sometimes your security up and dies on you. Quite true. Uh, but we feel, we bankers, uh, that the automobile has not and cannot prove itself. It is what we call a rat hole speculation. I see. Then, then paving on Main Street and the state highway through the town, that'd be a rat hole speculation too, huh? Exactly, Mr. Hunter. However, if you're insistent upon a loan, we might advance the money uh, secured by the tools in your repair shop and such other things of value you possess, and then a personal note. All right. As long as I can just buy the car. Very well. Uh, I presume you intend the vehicle for business purposes? Uh, well, in a way, I'll be driving over to Ithaca every week. Oh, you're expanding your activities? Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm going over to take dancing lessons. <laughs> Understand me, Tom. I'm glad you asked me to dance. But what about Lucy Brackett? Uh, she's, uh, she's Asa Parker's date. Well, that hasn't stopped her from smiling at you all evening. See? She's looking at you right now. Go over and talk to her, Tom. Well, I, I may, but it'll end the same way. We, we always start quarreling. A very good sign. Oh, what's good about it? Well, people don't quarrel unless they mean something to each other. Well... Uh, Would you excuse me, then? Of course, Tom. Oh, nice. uh, well, hello, Asa. Do you mind if I cut in? Well, no, I suppose not. May I, Lucy? All right. I was watching you with Mrs. Bannister. You dance extremely well, Tom. Well, I I've been taking lessons. So Asa told me. But why not here in town? Well, I, I heard there was an extra good teacher in Ithaca, and I, I wanted to be extra good. A woman teacher? Well, I wouldn't dance with a man. <laughs> She's young? Oh, yes. Uh, by the way, how's your father? Oh, he's well, thank you. Uh, very pretty? Your father? <laughs> Don't be silly. Oh, 
Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, she's quite attractive. I see. Oh, by the way, I hear that you might be going into some other line of business. No. Well, you can tell your father I'm sticking with the automobile. I think it's here to stay. Don't you think you're being rather stubborn? Well, I'm stubborn enough to want to see the automobile made into a really fine piece of machinery. Gee, I'm working on some mechanical improvements, and one of them may make me rich someday. And you're interested in being rich? Lucy, I'm interested in what the automobile can do for everybody. Well, we're isolated here. Like in all small towns, we need paved roads and cars to keep us in touch with the rest of the world. Think what it'll mean when we can drive easily and cleanly clear across the country and enjoy all the beauties that God has given this land of ours. It means a new kind of freedom for everybody. Tom, would you please stop making speeches? Oh. Yeah, I, I guess I was, wasn't I? You were. Now, just listen to the music. Let yourself feel it. All right. This is, uh, this is awful nice, isn't it? Perfect. Yeah. Hey, what's Tom, what's the matter? The music. Well, Lucy, Lucy. What's wrong, Gid? Lucy, you better come home quick. Your father's been hurt awful bad. Dad? He was run over on Main Street oh. by an automobile. Come on, Lucy. I don't need your help, Mr. Hunter. Stay here and talk about your beloved automobiles that, that kill people. Asa, Asa. Gid, what's the doctor say? He ain't around to say anything, Tom. Doc Randall went to Albany this morning. Yep, I guess Andy's done for. Well, I'll get him a doctor. I'll bring one from Ithaca. Tom, there isn't time. You'd be all night. I've got my car, Gid. I'll make it. I've got to. Tom, you awake? Yes, Hazel. Oh, it's almost dawn. I'm going home and get some sleep. You might as well, too. No, I'll, I'll wait here and see what the doctor has to say. Well, I'm going anyway. Uh, tell Lucy I said good night. All right. If I see her. Mr. Hunter. Oh, yes, doctor. Mr. Brackett wants to see you. Y you mean he's conscious? Oh, he's going to be fine. If I had gotten here one hour later, I'm afraid it would have been hopeless. Oh, you've been just wonderful, doctor. Oh, I don't know if anything is wonderful. It's that you and I survived that wild ride. I know a horse and buggy could never have made it. Tom? Oh, yes, Mr. Brackett. Lucy. Lucy, let him sit here on the bed. Yes, Father. Tom, I want you to know how it happened. Well, I, I think I know, sir. I was starting to cross Main Street. A team of horses came along. They raised so much dust, I couldn't see where I was going. <coughs> Oh, Father, please. No, Lucy. Let me finish. I was hit by a car. But it could as easily have been a buggy. I couldn't see. The driver couldn't either. It was that confounded dust, Tom. The dirt road you wanted paved. Yeah. It, it's just got to be done, sir. I'll see that it is done. And if it means more cars and no horses, that's all right, too. Maybe, Tom, you and I'll wind up in the same business. Partners. Oh, Mr. Brackett, I, I'd i like that. Mr. Hunter, I think perhaps you and Miss Brackett had better... Yes, uh, yes. Uh, good night, sir. Good night. Good night, boy. I'll stay with him until he goes to sleep. Young lady, you you better get some rest. Not just yet, Doctor. Tom, let's go out on the porch. Well, it's uh, getting light in the east. Mm -hmm. Tom, Father and I owe you everything for what you've done. No, no, I, I don't want your gratitude. You've got it. And more. Lucy. Earlier tonight, when we were dancing, I kept waiting for you to take me out on the balcony. There was a full moon. I kept hoping... You did? See, all the time I was so nervous, I... I thought I had to keep on talking. Oh, Tom, you'd only learn when to forget automobiles. All right. They're forgotten. As of now. Just for a while, Tom. And then you can think about them the rest of your life. And I'll help you. If you want me to. Lucy. Oh, Lucy, my darling. 
Look. There's the first ray of the sun. It's dawn. And another day. A wonderful new day, Lucy. Not just for you and me, but for our town and the thousands of little towns like ours all over America. Your father was injured by a motor car, but a motor car saved his life, and it'll save thousands more. Doctors will get to the sick more quickly. People will be able to drive to the far corners of America and learn more and more about their great land. The motor car will link east and west, north and south. We'll be strangers no longer, but friends. And we'll see it all, Lucy, you and I, together. James Hilton will return in a moment. Doesn't it give you a comfortable feeling when you know you've done the right thing? Like remembering that Aunt Clara takes lemon and no cream in her tea? Or that Uncle Edward always wants to sit up with a driver? <laughs> well, now, you know, you've often heard me talk about the joy of the person receiving a Hallmark card. But there's also a pleasure the sender of a card feels. It comes from the knowledge that you are expressing your thoughtfulness in the socially correct way manifesting your good taste in a form of beauty and pleasure your friends will appreciate. So on those occasions when you want to celebrate a birthday, an anniversary, the arrival of a new baby, or just any day you want to remember your friends and loved ones in a special way, visit the store where Hallmark cards are sold. You'll find a card that expresses your feelings beautifully, one that says what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And remember that Hallmark on the back tells your friends, you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you for your excellent performance on the Hallmark Playhouse tonight, Robert Cummings. Well, I enjoyed being here, Mr. Hilton, and I like playing the role of Tom Hunter. I can imagine how the role appealed to you, because you're something of a present-day Tom Hunter yourself. Yes. I, I understand you've got quite a workshop at home. Yes, that's right, Mr. Hilton. I've had a workshop ever since I was a little boy. But my real love today is airplanes. I like speed as long as it's safe and has a reason. I like to get where I'm going in a hurry. I guess that's one of the reasons I like Hallmark cards so much. They surely help, help keep friendship going at a rapid clip. And you're certainly someone who's made a lot of friends, Bob. Well, thank you, Jimmy. And I also think the Hallmark Playhouse is doing a fine thing in reminding all of us how important mail is, particularly mail to the boys in the service. I remember when I was in the Air Force, mail call was the highlight of the day for most of us. Well, thank you, Bob. It's been fine having you with us. Now, next week, we shall bring to our Hallmark Playhouse a heroic story which has been read and reread by many generations since its publication over a century ago. Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mast. And to play the starring role, we shall have Edmund O'Brien. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our story tonight was dramatized by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Mr. Cummings may soon be seen in the Columbia Pictures production, The Barefoot Mailman. The role of Lucy tonight was played by Barbara Eiler, Ed Begley was Gid, Parley Bear, Andy. Others in our cast included Lois Corbett, Carlton Young, and Howard McNear. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Edmund O'Brien in Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mass. And among our honored guests in the weeks to come will be the distinguished names Sarah Churchill and Ethel Barrymore on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.